I did. I'm still getting used to it. a fundraiser. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for being here. And like Prague said, there are a lot of other things going on tonight. And I think that just speaks to uh, what a vibrant community we have. And we're in different places uh, doing different things tonight. So thank you all for being here. I've been wanting to do something like this for years. Um, so I'm really excited. Please do not feel slighted if you're in the audience and you consider yourself a person of the media. Um, this is just the beginning of the conversation, and this is a pretty amazing representation of what we have here in the South Sound. So I'm really excited. We have Tony Holm, and I think just to be brief, I'm going to just do your bio. Um, I have media organization descriptions. I wanted this to be as paper-free as possible tonight. So I'll just put it on our website. Thank you, Scott Bishop, yes, who does our website. Okay, Tony Holm is the station manager and owner of Mix96.1 KXXO and Mix96.com. She and David built and put the station on the air in January 1990. Previously, she has worked for Associated Press, KQED TV, Chaos Radio, and Safe Place. She's a graduate of the Evergreen State College and also proud of one of Antioch College, Yellow Springs. And this is Rick Crawford, the Christian Mason Senior News, and I forgot his little bio. So, Rick, if you could just uh, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Rick from, I actually came from the south side of Chicago. I was studying forestry in Central Illinois. There are no forests. Uh, so I came to Washington and I wasn't doing too well in the uh, physics department, so I was uh, started a project to uh, summer job. The council on aging wanted to start a senior newspaper. That was the summer of 1976, and I'm still there. Um, so the senior news is its 35th birthday. Then we have Marissa Luck. Uh, Marissa is a community journalist and part-time content director at a local web design firm. She recently graduated from Evergreen, where she studied political economy, tutored writing, and served on the editorial collectives for the campus publications, the, Cooper, oh, the Counterpoint Journal, I love it, sorry, and Inkwell. She regularly contributes to Works in Progress and Olympia Power and Light. Then we have Jerry Redeker of the Olympian. She says, I grew up in Des Moines and came to Thurston County in the 70s, working briefly at the Centralia Chronicle and then beginning in 1982 at the Olympian. Her first job here was as a part-time food editor, and she's been a wire editor, copy editor, news editor, weekend editor, entertainment writer, and magazine editor, features editor, communities editor, and now senior editor. What all that means, she says, is that for the last 30 years, I've been chasing news in our community and figuring out how to share it with me. Matthew Green. Matthew moved to Olympia in 1986 to attend Evergreen and stuck around. He started helping people get elected to the Olympia City Council and then served on the City Council himself. He's also been involved with neighborhood associations and on the board of Bread and Roses. In 2009, he and Meta Hogan started Olympia College. Then we have Deborah. 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 Okay. Deborah's career in nonprofit community media began in Ohio in 1983. She went TCTV, sorry. She joined TCTV in 1990 as the executive director, CEO. In 1999, Deborah was recognized by the Alliance for Community Media with the Busk Leadership Award, and in 2005 by the Girl Scouts of Southwest Washington as a woman of distinction. She currently serves as the chairperson for the ACM. Northwest Region and is a member of the South Sound Partners for Philanthropy Executive Committee. She and her husband, Lex, live in Olympia. <laughs> and then we have Holly Peterson, Smith Peterson of the Business Examiner. Business Examiner reporter Holly Smith Peterson's career began with a journalism degree from Ohio State University. Copywriting for the American Automobile Association and the Cincinnati Inquirer, the Cincinnati Post, were followed by two years of worldwide backpacking solo while writing travel guides and cultural books for Oxford University Press, Random House, Voters Travel 
Textile Guides, Princess Hall, Sierra Club, the National Textbook Company, and more. Originally, her articles have appeared in the Seattle Times, Kitsap Sun, and Gig Harbor Life, and online for many media outlets. A solo parent for the last decade, in what spare time she does have, she enjoys doing anything outdoors with her three kids and watching baseball. All right. Uh, you're going to be mine. If you want to, I'm not technically on the panel. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, Janine Unsold is on the panel untechnically, and she is uh, representing Green Pages, but she also has her own blog on Little Hollywood uh, blog. Um, so that is our panel. We are going to get each of them will get have a chance to make a statement about how. Um, I'm not sure what your statements are going to be, but <laughs> hopefully we will have some bearing on what, how your particular medium fits into the overall uh, picture of communicating to the public and through the format that you choose. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have anybody who is an active blogger other than uh, I mean, we oh, do have Janine. Sorry, I, sh we, yeah. I should have mentioned that I did invite uh, Matthias Eichler, and, um, who does Everyday Olympia, and uh, he's a downtown business owner, and he was unable to make it at the last minute. Um, okay, so, and then, well, the, the comments are, while the, the talks are being presented, while the pre presenters are, are saying what they have to say, there are green cards in a basket back there. I will just go around with, circulate around with the basket and the cards so that you can write out questions and then we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And they can be directed to individuals or a question that everyone can answer. Eventually, <laughs> 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 I'm Tony Paul, but I'm here representing Mix 96.1 Radio and Mix 96.com. I am not an announcer. I started radio as a hearing <coughs> So take yeah, that hold on. We can continue. Oh, okay. I'm Tony Holm, and I'm here representing Mix 96.1 Radio and Mix96.com. As I said previously, I'm not a personality. I started radio as an engineer. So please accord me not being a great public speaker. Um, Mix 96.1 is a locally owned and soft operated soft rock radio station so serving southwest Washington with an emphasis on the South Sound. The station studios are at downtown Olympia, right down here, and our tower is at Rooster Rock. And Broadcasting at 85,000 watts from a height of 4,000 feet, which is in near Cinnabar, Washington, it's in Lewis County. Uh, although we can be heard all over southwest Washington, we focus on our local service area, the South Sound communities in Thurston, Pierce, Mason, and Lewis County. When we went on the air in January two, uh, 22 years ago, the FCC, uh, it's a little about how our media has changed, our industry has changed, the FCC allowed one company to own up to seven AM stations, seven FM stations, and seven TV stations, 21 stations nationwide. That was called diversity of media ownership. Today, stations like ours, standalone, local radio stations, particularly large ones, are way more unusual. Major companies like Clear Channel, 50% owned by Bain Capital, and has 850 stations nationwide, or about 10% of the licenses allowed in the United States. They also own billboards, Live Nation, the big ticket broker that controls almost all the concerts in the United States, and Cumulus Broadcasting, of whom, surprisingly, Bain Capital is also a majority owner, has it's the next largest, and they have 700, or I'm sorry, 570 stations nationwide, and that's way more common. They and some other smaller national groups own now over 60% of the media market, major market stations in the U.S. We're going to call that non-diversity. Um, despite regulation and decentralization of ownership and programming, I think we're living and broadcasting proof that live radio is still alive and well. We believe that locally owned and programmed radio stations do the best job of serving needs of the local community. Despite the growth in all forms of media, radio is still pervasive, listened to by over 93% of all Americans weekly. You may get news from the internet, music from Pandora or Apple, or weather information from your phone, but sooner or later you're probably going to use the ubiquitous and pervasive service 24-7, 365 days a year, 
always available and always free radio. Um, you ask about demographics. Our listeners are primarily, well certainly not entirely, adults 35, 65, roughly two-thirds women. Although primarily a music station, the fact we're local and not programmed for a national audience. When I was talking about those 570 stations, they have seven formats, or eight formats, and they're all done out of one location, and an EJ sits in a box and goes, and the weather today in Olympia is, and they record these liners which are then played to give the illusion that they're a local station. We have real people in the studio, and we do record some of the broadcasts, but they're live, and they're here, and they live here in our local community. Um, although primarily a music station, I said, we can do local traffic, weather, school closings, and features VR to the local community. It makes the station attractive to commuters and work listeners, stay-at-home moms, work-at-home moms, and as we always notice, we're on almost every dentist office in Olympia. <laughs> Our website, Mix96.com, has become a hub of information for local events. This has been an outgrowth of the public service announcements on the air. We average 1,100 to 1,200 unique visitors daily, except on snow days. Then the number goes up six to eight times. Uh, proving that even though people get information from a lot of places, a place that agglomerates school closings, community events closings, delays, and all that information in one place is still very, very popular. Uh, radio and the web have a unique ability, and this is something that we've really found to complement each other, because radio is really good at getting people's attention, but it's poor at details, like the phone number. How many times have you actually understood a phone number you've heard repeated five times? No, radio is really good at saying, hey, this cool thing is going on. Go to the web and get the details about where, when, the times, how you register, how you get more information. Uh, the web is great at giving information. But it kind of sits there, and unless you go looking for it, you don't find it. Radio isn't great at telling you it's there, go find it. Um, so they can also be used simultaneously. How many people do you know who listen to the radio while they're at their computer and they sit and type things in the hear? Although we're primarily a music station, we pride ourselves on local community service. Um, after all, we do live here, and this matters to us because this is our community we live in. Um, we offer free public service announcements to any nonprofit organizations, both on the air or on the web at mix96.com slash PSA. And remember, our mix has two X's, so it's www.mixx96.com. We sponsor a number of community fundraiser and events, and put particular energy to two of them. The station twice a year does an all-day fund drive for the Little Red Schoolhouse Project that raises school supplies and money for local students need, and also a wrapping up the holidays drive where we work with a number of local agencies to help families around the December holidays. In addition to clothing, supplies, and toys, listeners donate thousands of dollars to help families in need, and 100% of the money goes to the direct service providers. The station does all the overhead so that all the money that is donated can go directly to the agencies and it goes directly for direct services. Um, and that's very important to us. We realized early on we went on the air that we could donate a little money every year to various organizations, or we could use that money to pay our staff, pay for all the overhead, and put on a fundraiser that would get everybody in the community to know about these organizations and donate to them directly. So that's very important to us. Uh, we're also excited that we're adding a new local program debuting this Sunday. And longtime radio announcer and community member Dick Poost, who I'm sure a lot of you know or are familiar with from KGY many years ago, is bringing his passion for Olympia area to us. We're debuting a new half-hour weekly community conversation called It's Your Community, and it's going to start airing this Sunday at 9 a.m. And if you want to contact Dick or you need to send us a PSA or any more information, there's some little slips of paper back there that have the web address on it, how to send a PSA, information on contacting Dick. You can always go to mix96.com with two X's and click on the Contact Us button. I get all that email, and I send it to whoever it belongs to. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs> and I'm going to step in here a little bit as the moderator and just uh, remind our panelists that in order to have everybody have a chance to speak, that we um, had talked about three and three and four minutes of presentation, but we can try to do some um, stuff briefly. Won't be a problem. Um, <laughs> The Senior News belongs to a nonprofit organization called the Thurston County Council on Aging that's been around since the 60s, and that was like when Medicare was started, so we've been around a long time. Um, they all got, uh, all the people that were active in the senior community were getting newsletters, like 12 to 15 a month, so they thought they'd hire some kid to put all the newsletters together and uh, send them out to every senior they could find. So I got the voter's registration file, took everybody that was born before 1916, put them on a mailing list put out the first newspaper and uh, it was called the Birdcage Liner. Uh, the 
they didn't, they didn't <laughs> like my sense of humor, and uh, so they said go with something generic. They called it Thurston County Senior News, and uh, we've done contests ever since, and that one always is the one that wins. So it's been the Thurston and Mason Senior, much to my chagrin. Um, the Council on Aging, like I said, is a nonprofit. Uh, the paper is free. We survive by advertising, and uh, the readers send donations. We send a letter out once a year asking them to help us out. And we also have a medical equipment bank. It's kind of like a library. People donate uh, wheelchairs, walkers, stuff like that. And my volunteers then turn around and uh, loan them back out to people that need them. And so it's like a trade program. Uh, I'm the only paid staff. I'm the only paid staff the senior news has ever had. And uh, we survive with a group of uh, dedicated senior volunteers and uh, community support. We about died a few years ago, just like all print media. And luckily, uh, um, skated through just in time. Our readership is growing. 16,500 papers go out every month. Um, and uh, seems to be climbing. We can't print enough of them. Seems like these days. So, um, happy to be here. Thank you. And I'm actually, I'm here representing Works in Progress. Um, we call it WIP a lot of times, it's an acronym. And I've actually only been working with Works in Progress for about six months. So I'm pretty new to the organization, but the main person, Sylvia, who is going to be speaking here, is ill. And it's also in the middle of our production week, so she's a bit stressed. So I'm standing in, and Sandia can also answer some questions. She's in the crowd. Um, but yeah, so Works in Progress started in. 1990, and uh, I guess some of the community members then, I wasn't in Olympia then, um, but some of the community members felt that the mainstream media, the Olympian, wasn't adequately covering local news, so their response was to create a, uh, a newspaper, and it kind of grew out of the Rainbow Coalition, and it started at a time, um, I think right before the U.S. invaded the Iraq, um, Iraq for the first time, and apparently it was like a really exciting time, and Without the internet, Works in Progress is one of the few ways that people could get uh, local print alternative media in Olympia. Um, and since then, we've you know had coverage of you know the controversy over the isthmus and the leading up to the '99 WTO protest, and uh, more recently the BDS uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions, um, and all those different things have sort of helped with gain the reputation of challenging the status quo and really the mission statement is a lot about um, kind of giving exposure to stories that are a lot of times uh, ignored in the mainstream media and giving people space to share those stories and it really is a lot about activists like talking to one another um, through this media and um, one of the points that Sylvia told me to emphasize was um, something that Teresa, one of our members, said early on, which was that works in progress is more than, it's, it's not the paper, it's not the newspaper that's important, it's the community that we serve that's important. And I guess they feel that when the paper has strayed away from that core value, then it becomes less relevant. Um, and so, yeah, so, and oh, yeah, for, I think, I don't remember if I said we're a progressive local monthly newspaper. Um, and we're volunteer run. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Well, I'm the mainstream media. <laughs> I'm, I'm at the Olympian. Um, like my bio said, I've been there for 30 years. And uh, all of the things we've talked about today clearly affect the Olympian as a daily newspaper. We publish every single day, still in print, and 24 hours a day online, which is a hugely evolving way for us to get our troops across. Just this, this week when uh, there was a triple shooting in Lacey, we had multiple updates of that story online um, day, uh, three quarters of a day before we could, we could put anything in print. So the way we deliver news is changing a lot. It's also, of course, affected our, our business, both the, the increase in digital media. We, we're finding that more and more people are not even using us on computer, but on mobile. So people are using iPads and iPhones and, and mobile apps to access their news. And I'm sure not just the internet, but 
all other kinds of news because we're on multiple platforms, including Twitter and Facebook. And we still do a newspaper where our most loyal readers are senior citizens. <laughs> so it's a broad readership that we attempt to, um, well, satisfy is impossible, <laughs> but maybe uh, equally annoy all aspects <laughs> is, is more of a reachable goal. Um, we are corporate owned, which I know is probably of, of some interest here. Um, I can say that the corporation is not one bit interested in the news decisions that we make. There has never been any kind of corporate directive on any kind of editorial position for us to take. The corporation is extremely interested in if we make money. So, and anybody involved in any media knows the challenges with that, and that is um, right now more related to the recession that we're all, every one of us is feeling in one way or another. As um, small businesses have less money, they have less money to advertise, um, people are choosing to drop things like subscriptions as their family incomes drop. So that is a challenge. And the Olympian has, like many papers, been forced to shrink to accommodate it. Um, our publisher likes to say that we're the best newspaper that community is willing to pay for, which is, I guess, true for most businesses. Personally, I, I love journalism, and our core product is journalism, and that's not going to change regardless of how we deliver it or how many people there are. Everybody needs the products of good journalism, and um, other publications can go into to niche views or advocacy, we still try to do the mainstream media approach of um, neutral observers. As neutral as human beings can be, everybody obviously brings their own experience into a story. So, um, since I got a couple of good points, but I probably just my time. I'll take questions. <laughs> starting a media something, we pondered doing a website, doing a blog, and we ended up with a piece of paper, which flies in the face of a lot of people's comments about the future of media. The reason we did it is we want to be, we, well, we had a couple things. One, we wanted to be very local. We cover Olympia and the greater Olympia area. And in particular, downtown Olympia. We thought that downtown Olympia wasn't getting covered well in any uh, any media, local media outlet. That that it was kind of being overlooked. We also wanted to do more, as as much as we could, more in-depth stories. Uh, just to contrast this, is, you know, our criticism, just to contrast, the Olympian is capable of writing about the Olympia City Council every day, or even after every week, about what they do, and we don't have that capacity. But we pride ourselves on writing more depth about certain issues that the Olympia City Council is writing on, for example. And we try to what, delve a little deeper into things people haven't heard of. We try to also run profiles of people or businesses uh, that people that might not know about. Um, we also had read some silly stuff that's just fun. But we, we refer to it as sometimes as ruthlessly local. We have told some of our writers, no, we don't want to write about that topic. Somebody from out, out of town is coming to speak here. No, we'll, we'd rather focus on what somebody in town is working on. Uh, state government is right on the edge for us. Uh, we'll cover it if it's specifically affecting Olympia, but not necessarily if it's affecting the state. Uh, issues and the reason for that is we thought that we were only going to be successful if, among other things, we focus on one niche that we can try to be really good at and that people get used to looking for us and wanting to find our paper so that they can get information about that thing. Rather than necessarily trying to be the be all end all. And also a piece of paper that we can literally stick out in a coffee shop where there's copies over here or wherever so that it's in front of somebody. And we do it for free, we do it advertised, supported, 
there have been other weekly papers like this over the years. Each one's lasted anywhere from one to three years. Or so. We're a little over two years right now, so hopefully we can extend that trend a little bit longer. Um, and we have a website. Frankly, it's not as active because we don't, we haven't gotten into the, the kind of the daily get something up there every day, which is the nature of the online world. We've definitely put more focus into the newspaper to try to cover Olympia news and more depth than we see this week. Television celebrated its 25th anniversary last December, um, and it, I was just sharing that with Peter Moulton, who was at our party, and I was like, my gosh, that's three and a half months already, so. Um, we are a, a nonprofit community media organization. Community is our middle name. That's very important. And, um, and there's one other electronic uh, media person at the table, um, Tony, and she's in the commercial side of, of media. The big difference between what we do and what many of the other um, media outlets at the table do is that what you see on the channels of Thurston Community Television is community generated. Um, our staff does produce some programming, um, either through contract services for organizations or for um, the jurisdictions that provide part of our funding. But when you look at Channel 22 specifically, our public access print, uh, uh, channel, 100% of what you see on that channel is either created by members of the community or brought to us by organizations in the community because they believe that the information is relevant to our community. We don't um, decide what your story is. You tell your story, we provide the resources to help you do it. Uh, on an annual basis, on we currently manage four channels on the Comcast cable system. If you are not a Comcast or Fairpoint, if you live in the Yelm area, Fairpoint cable carries our channels. If you don't have cable, if you're on satellite or television antenna, you don't get our services because we are a creature of the cable system. Uh, but we have four channels on the Comcast cable system, and on an annual basis, 17,000 hours of programming are programmed onto those channels. Uh, and of that 17,000 hours, probably about 5,000 of it is first run. So we do lots of repeats. In fact, we were doing that kind of thing where you'd see something three or four times a week before American Movie Classics was doing it. We had that, that pattern down pat, you know. So, um, but I think uh, just to move the conversation along, what, and I see a lot of familiar faces. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because I see a lot of folks who have been through our doors. Um, that community is... Um, our purpose. We are here to provide the community with a resource to speak neighbor to neighbor, neighbor to government. Um, you know, <clears throat> that's our purpose, and that's what we do. She's on. <laughs> this one. Can everybody hear me okay? No, no? I can't. Okay, a little closer. Yeah. That's better. All right, well, I'm Holly Peterson with the Business Examiner. We started out as a newspaper in 1985, and we want to talk about the changes in media. Our publisher, Jeff Rounce, actually started the paper as a business um, service to the South Sound community, which includes South King, Pierce, um, including JBLM, Thurston County, Mason, and Lewis Counties, and also Grace Harbor. So we have a pretty far reach. Um, it has been focused in Tacoma for in the beginning that's where our main office is based. We've since expanded to an office in Lacey to serve the Olympia and Thurston County areas. And since the beginning, we've now started a television program, South Sound Business Report, on KBTC and a couple other stations. Um, we now have a daily news feed on our website, so you can go and you can subscribe to that and get you know, daily updates of all kinds of different news in the South Sound. We're on different platforms as well, Facebook and Twitter, and um, we, do, we do various events around the South Sound as well. So basically, our purpose is to report the business news, and that's our journalism function, to gather the business community, and to help make partnerships, um, not only with the news, but just how can we help each other in the South Sound. So that's in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to just 
ask if there are any of the panelists who have anything that they want to say in response to something that they heard somebody else say, or do you have any questions you want to pose to one of your fellow panelists? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I have the first round of questions here. There is kind of a bit of a theme in some of them, and it has to do with the quality of the coverage and whether or not there is any element of influence on what gets reported by advertisers. And so, um, you know, one observation is that modern media now fragments and obfuscates the issues of vital importance to the public. Corporate, corporations get what they want. A public that reacts and is docile to only their ideas, their proposals, and their policies. All else is ignored. That's not really a question. <laughs> Do we have any responses to that? I can just start off and, and refute that. Um, what the business examiner likes to do because we're bi-weekly, we might cover the headlines in our daily news feeds or um, just you know, the social media piece of it, you know, what is happening. But because we're bi-weekly, we can go and report in depth and do longer articles. We also have the South Sound Business Report television program in which we will sit down and have a conversation with people about different issues. So it's not, you know, there's no influence there whatsoever. We explore from all sides and you know, as um, the Olympian said, just to, to be as fair and balanced as we can be. Well, I, as a for-profit newspaper, I think that we frequently hear this claim. I'd like to explain the firewall we put up between advertising and news. In of course we need advertising to survive. That's our main source of income. But that doesn't mean that advertisers can buy a news story. In fact, if an ad rep, one of our salespersons, has a news tip, they are very cautious about even approaching the city desk because of the appearance of influence. And what they are trained to tell their clients are, you need to send a separate news release on this issue to the news desk so that we can consider it on its merits as news for the readers. Um, we try to keep it as cleanly separated as possible. We have done things that have had serious revenue consequences for the Olympian because of news stories. We've had uh, the entire auto mall stop advertising when we've done stories critical of uh, business practices or when we were uh, reporting on the Lemon Law. That was that was a pretty big financial impact, but it did not affect how we did the news. That was a while ago, but that's just an example. So I just wanted to say that it's front of mind that we do have that firewall between advertising and news, and um, both sides honor it pretty, pretty strictly. We are also for profit, and I've actually had the, I was surprised on a couple of occasions, I guess I shouldn't have been, when businesses came to us and said, so we have to buy an ad to get a story, right? <laughs> and, and no, <laughs> actually. First of all, convince me, you know, one, here, buy an ad. Second, yeah. convince me <laughs> that you should do a story. And there's some, been some businesses that no, we didn't do a story. We have a regular feature called New Biz Only, it's a new business, and we've run businesses that don't buy ads, we've run businesses that do buy ads, we've not run businesses that have bought ads. Somebody came to us and said, well, we just changed ownership. So it's a new business, sort of. So I've been buying ads for a while through a story, and we didn't. Um, it's, But it is there. The sense is always there. Um, we have less of a physical firewall, because it's made at night. So I guess a firewall down the middle of our brain, that's the best we can do. But the, the thought is always there, and we do the best we can. Well, my experience is not from the commercial side of things, and I, I say this because Mark Fouch is here, and, um, our former mayor, and he had a long relationship with us. Um, um, there have been times when um, TCTV has been challenged by content um, that people find objectionable for whatever reason. So it's not so much the, 
uh, you know, that a, a commercial advertiser is coming and saying we're not going to advertise because you did a story critical of our industry. Um, but that, and I will, I will say that Mark was never one among the folks who called for questioning funding. Uh, but there, you know, I have faced times when um, elected officials would say to me, why are we helping to fund something that is uh, allowing this particular material to be on the channel, whatever the material was, whether it was, you know, um, um, yeah, well, there, there's that one. I mean, we kind of forget that one. I, I forgot that. So not in my mind anymore. But um, you know, but I, but I am, but I am very proud to say that you know, after sitting down and having conversations uh, with our elected officials, they do understand that TCTV, the the model that that our jurisdictions put in place when TCTV was founded and and funding became uh, a contract with the municipalities was that we we stand you know as you know kind of to keep everybody at arm's length when it comes to content so um, you know it can be challenging to sit behind the big desk and answer the questions and you know mitigate the crisis but um, you know our jurisdictions have stood very strong and said we believe people need a place to speak and we're going to support that we may not be always happy about it, and we're going to tell you when we're not happy about it, but we're not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater because there's so much really wonderful stuff and good information and important information being shared by our community that the things that some folks may find objectionable, whether it's a political perspective or a religious perspective or a, an artistic presentation that they don't like, we're not going to eliminate everybody else's access because of that very, very tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of objectionable programming. Okay. Unpopular speech. Unpopular speech. Yeah. First Amendment was designed uh -huh. to protect unpopular speech. Uh -huh. The First Amendment was designed to protect unpopular speech. Yep. Amen. Um, Tony, here is a question directly for you. Now, why don't I send this one? Can I yeah. share my questions here? Yeah. That's okay. I'll take this one. So it doesn't matter. So, Tony, there is a question here. Specifically for you. Um, and this has to do with another radio station, so the likely fate of KGY, question mark, AM low wattage, um, small coverage, FM wider coverage, port location is, a, is iffy in the long term, and, and moving is expensive. So do you have any thoughts on the future of KGY? I think it would be criminal if they didn't stay in business, they didn't stay locally owned. We're very proud that this local community has locally owned radio. It's very unusual that this community has somebody, and in that I include KGY as a real founding radio station here that has remained locally owned, even though after the death of their primary owner, the family has continued to keep it local and keep local people and keep live people on the air. I hope it won't be a problem. I think the port is trying to work with them to negotiate for relocation, and I hope that makes it possible to stay a locally owned station. Um, and this is a weird thing to say, but luckily for all of us, the bottom dropped out of people selling radio stations. And the huge prices people were being paid before aren't being paid anymore, and it makes it more likely for local stations to survive, because they're not being constantly tempted by the prospect of selling to Clear Channel, because Clear Channel isn't buying them, or they're buying stations in Seattle or Chicago. Um, so I think we're very fortunate, and also, you know, we have Chaos here, which is a local community station. We have KGY, and I believe KRXY is still locally owned, although they're from Australia, but I include that as locally. They're not part of a national company that programs everything nationally. What about KMES and Shelton? I think they are still locally owned. Last time I, I, <laughs> I confess I'm not. Are, are KMES dead. has actually gone to a new format. They've dropped all their music and they've gone to a new zone. Right, they've gone to a pre-programmed format that you can buy and put it on the air. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't involve okay. local people being involved. And that's why I don't know who's owning it anymore. It's yeah. unfortunate, but it's an economic reality for many little stations. Uh -huh. I mean, all of us have struggled. I think everyone's felt the, the effects. But for us, I know, we were very fortunate because so much of our advertising was local, where stations in the Seattle market lost like 30% of their advertising the minute the recession started. We lost most of our national advertising. We didn't have a lot of national advertising to begin with. So things are tight, but it's not as bad as it could be, and I really believe it's because of the strength of the local community and people support local businesses. 
So you can keep that down there. Okay. Okay. Have another, so can another mic from here. So this one is for Jerry. Um, and this basically is also how well you are contending with the hard times. Um, do you have any, uh, any statistics on um, print circulation trends, ad revenue trends, and when and if there's going to be a charge for online content? Well, I'll start at the end. The charge for online content is a huge challenge for every medium. Um, kind of screwed it up in the beginning when we gave it away for free <laughs> and it's pretty hard to put that back in the box. So a few publications, the New York Times has had uh, some success with a, a sort of paywall. What, what we're trying to do more is uh, create better online, online revenue from advertising and so forth and I'm not really, I don't know very much about that and I don't want to know very much about that. <laughs> because of what I was talking about earlier. So I can't really speak about ad revenue except that I know that uh, when it's good, we're happy, and when it's not, we're not. <laughs> as far as circulation, print circulation has fallen dramatically. Um, I don't have numbers, I'm sorry, I, I, but, I, but I know it's, it's, it, it's about 32,000 on Sunday, I believe, but it, that's down from close to 50 at our peak. But readership is up. If you count online viewers and um, pass through clicks on search engines and so forth, so we don't get money for most of that. So it, it's kind of a challenge. More people are reading what we produce and fewer people are buying it. <laughs> um, and then I'd also like to say that we are still here in Olympia. My job is to run the local news gathering team. We're up there on the hill. A lot of that building is empty because some of those departments have moved elsewhere and emerge um, with our sister paper in Tacoma, which frankly has allowed us to survive. If we were not that close to another major uh, publication with our company, I would have been pretty tough. Uh, but the news gathering has stayed entirely local. The reporters are in our newsroom. Our uh, Capitol Bureau is still on the hill. We have two reporters and an intern for the legislative session, which is about one third of the statewide uh, legislative reporter coverage. Um, just as an example of what's happened as the economy has shrunk, at the peak there were 21 reporters on the Hill from all over the state. Now there are single figures. That means there's a whole lot of stories a whole lot of committee meetings that affect certain communities in eastern Washington or southwest Washington or somewhere that there's no reporter looking at. Um, for practical purposes, we form news partnerships with organizations that used to be our bitter comp competition, and it's everybody's done it because it's the only way to survive. And so if the Associated Press is doing a story, I tell my guy, do something else. Where before it would have been, we don't want to use AP, we want our own byline on that, and we just can't afford that. I think, although we're not in the newspaper business, it's a little different than any advertising supported business. I think now would agree with this. It's about creating compelling enough content because we don't charge for the people who listen to the radio station. You don't charge for your readers. You don't charge your readers. It's creating compelling enough content that enough people will watch it, listen to it, pay attention to it, that the advertiser gets a benefit from the number of people who see the ads. And it's also about matching. One of the things that, that is a real new thing about the web is you can somewhat match advertisers' needs to the content. For example, we have a sponsor who comes on who sponsors our school closing pages only on days when schools are closed. And they pay only for advertising on the days when schools are closed, which is what I said, our, our people viewing the pages goes up six to eight times. So one of the things that's exciting about web advertising it has things to do with, with radio too, is you can match your content, and anybody who advertises should know they should be trying to match the audience that's looking at, listening to, seeing, viewing, consuming the content to what they're selling, and make sure, a, a silly example of this, but I know this is something, we had one time a roofing contractor come to us, and their product was a product that was sold only to people who basically owned, who had a lot of money and owned their last home. It was a permanent roofing product. And we advised them they should go 
advertise on KGY, which at the time had a much older audience, because this is not a product 20-somethings buy for their first home. This is a product people in their 60s buy for a home they don't want to maintain. You have to match, and I think one of the things about the web is there's some compelling opportunities <coughs> to match that content to the advertising. Okay, I get it. Do, do people need me to use the mic? No. Um, okay, what I am going to do is use this as a segue because there is an important question here. And that has basically to do with the competition in the news field versus the collaboration. And um, Jerry, you were saying that you don't compete so much anymore, but you just let them do it. So the, the question that was posed is, and I will preface this by saying that sometimes when there is a blog that, because they are pretty real time, and so they can see something happen and they can go home and they can, can type it out. Sometimes there are newspapers who will pick up on a blog story and then not give credit to the blogger or the, the website, the blog site that, that did break that story. And so the question is, do any of you actively compete for news with others on the panel? And secondarily, do any of you actively collaborate with others on the panel? And, and I will say again, this is a little bit of history that Marissa, you're probably not aware of, but Green Pages and a Speech and Whip, um, there has been a lot of consideration on both sides. Um, to possibly merge those two entities. Um, Green Pages and the South Sound Indicators Project, um, you know, Sustainable South Sound, that sort of stuff. So there has been some consideration for collaboration and even merger. That hasn't come about because there's still this need to be maintain personal or individual of instant organizational identity. So. Well, I'm going to start because it's easy. We don't have a news agency, so we don't compete for news. But we collaborate with a lot of these organizations. We collaborate with the Olympian frequently on things like candidates forums. Um, we carry the program that South Sound Business Examiner produces. So, um, you know, oh, senior, yeah, senior, the senior news. Um, so, you know, so we we think from our perspective that it's important that it doesn't matter to us where the information comes from as long as we, if we can be a resource to help get it to you. So, that's where we are. Besides the senior news, I'm the vice president of a group called the Senior Action Network. It's kind of like a chamber of commerce for businesses that work with seniors, which when I look out at the room from the head table, it's like all my advertisers sitting there. It's a wonderful <laughs> site. Wonderful site. Um, and uh, once a month they have a centerfold in the Sunday paper before our meeting in the Olympian. And I work real closely with Sasha on that, so uh, so that uh, we get advertising that supports that page and gets it out into there. The Olympians in the audience too, and then it's also almost the same information as in the senior news. So there is a lot of collaboration between the senior people and the Olympian and the senior. That's advertising collaboration. The right. Too. Right. Right. But so part of what I do every day is. I'm browsing the web, I'm looking at other news sources, I'm looking at everything. Um, most of it is websites, so if it's not a very active website, I'm probably not noticing a lot. I have my Twitter feed has is loaded up with media outlets, and I see a lot of news that breaks on Twitter, um, but it, it WSP traffic reports, uh, the Freewood Hero, just all kinds of things. And mostly what we use that for is to say, hey, we should check that out. And then if we're going to report it, we check it out with our own reporting, unless it's reported from one of our established news partners, which are the Coma News Tribune, which is a sister newspaper, um, the Seattle Times, which is 49% McClatchy, and uh, Cairo. However, I frequently will get calls from news producers of other radio stations and say, can we use your photograph? We'll credit you. Um, and if there's a news story that has an angle to another newspaper out of our area, it's not at all uncommon for the newspapers to call each other and say, hey, that guy grew up here, we, we talked to his parents, do you want that? And we say, sure, and we'll send you our stuff about what he did here. But one of the, the great things about these niche, and maybe I can call them ad, advocacy products, is that 
they can take a more intense view. They can maybe, my impression is, have a, have a different mission than, um, than trying to be a generalist and get the news of the day, what happened today, how can we get that in that day's news product. They have a little, a little more um, time to take the energy and, and, and focus in ways that we try to do, but you can't, you can't do it with every story every day. I will admit to yeah, scanning a lot of other local websites, Only Blog, for example, and, and seeing something and like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if there's a, a deeper story there. I wouldn't just run something of theirs. I, I did actually buy one of Janine's stories one time. I paid, her, I paid you for that. And uh, the, but I see a, see a mention of something 